Hello, and just interrupting Ducky there on the microphone with the band Homebrew, local Santa Cruz musicians, one of my oldest friends, Ducky, she is, and uh, yeah, that's their track, Mirrors, off their new album, Homebrew, Santa Cruz, can be found on Bandcamp, so thanks so much for allowing me that theme music for the show Unquestionable, which you are hearing right now with myself, Dan Wu. And I'm just running into the station in the middle. I feel like I'm writing a paper last minute right now because there's just so much to research for this topic that I chose for today's show on KZSE Santa Cruz, which as a non-commercial educational radio station, KZSE supports free expression of ideas. Please be aware that the opinions expressed are those of the speakers or artists only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the UC Regents, KZSE staff, management, or underwriters. We welcome your feedback on our programming. Please direct your comments to the Program Review Committee at 831-459-4726 or by email at prc at kzsc.org. And... The Friends of the Library of Hawaii exists to support and promote Hawaii's public libraries. Their work includes maintaining public libraries and securing materials for the institutions beyond the scope of the ordinary library budget. Everyone is welcome to donate books to a branch library in Hawaii. If you'd like to make a financial contribution, a librarian will make a selection on your behalf in the subject of your choice. For more information, visit friendsofthelibraryofhawaii.org or call 808-536-4174. Sleepy John Sandich has hosted KZSE's call-in talk show, Talk About, for decades. He covers local issues and people, and he opens the phone lines for you to ask your questions live on the air. Talk About with John Sandich airs every Wednesday from 7 to 8.30 p.m., directly after the Pacifica Evening News on KZSE Santa Cruz 88.1 FM. And this is Unquestionable, myself, Dan Wu, and I am here today to talk about something that is very related to topics I've been covering on the show this summer, and it's a little bit of a new twist on the whole thing, but I want to ask the listeners... To call in at 831-459-4036 once I get into the topic with your thoughts or questions on the whole thing. And I'm going to have Susan Shelley, the Vice President of Communications for the Howard Jarvis Tax Association, call in at about 12.15 for a segment of the show. But I also want to leave the phone lines open at times for others to call in. So she'll probably be on for, I don't know, normal news show style interview and must many of you are probably asking who is Howard Jarvis and what is the Howard Jarvis Tax Association well today's show is going to be about prop 13 and i really want views from the community on this crazy deal I want to propose to you. What if I told you there was a way in California where your cost of living could continually go down in comparison to everyone else's and
basically, as cost of living rises here and we talk about rent control and we talk about high taxes and we talk about high gas prices and we talk about all the money pouring in and people being able to just buy houses at crazy prices and pushing everyone that maybe has been here and not making mountains of money. Uh, some of those people are feeling pushed out. The Howard Jarvis Association, Tax Association, essentially came about because of that same type of fear back in the 1970s. And I just want to give a little background on what Prop 13 is. People can call in as well. I bet a lot of you are saying, I kind of know what Prop 13 is, but I have no idea really what you're talking about. And that's fair. And it's kind of unfortunate because Prop 13 basically controls, for better or worse, a lot of life that happens in California is dictated by an undercurrent of Prop 13's after effects and continued effects. And essentially, in the 1970s, in 1977, property tax in California was 2.67%. And in some communities, counties, cities, they would pass little additions to that. So the Howard Jarvis Association basically found out, they learned or sought out, people that were having trouble staying in their homes because their property tax bills were going up very high because the value of their home was growing and maybe the local community was also possibly tacking on little property taxes here and there to cover various government services, um, mainly education was the main uh, relationship between property taxes and local school systems. The property taxes would fund the schools. And so in times like the late 70s, when there was a recession happening, communities were looking for ways of raising more money for schools. And coincidentally, Jerry Brown was our governor at the same time. And the Howard Jarvis Association realized that they could capitalize and also highlight, for better or worse, like I said, they could either capitalize on it if you don't like Prop 13 or highlight if you do like Prop 13 about the fact that there were people that couldn't stay in their homes if their property taxes were doubling in one year and they didn't expect that bill or you know, doubling two years in a row or going up by 50% the second year after doubling once. That would be kind of crazy if you think about it in those terms. So what the Howard Jarvis Association came in and proposed, well, Howard Jarvis himself, in fact, at the time, was Prop 13, which said that no property taxes in the state can go above 1%. And on top of that, they wrote in that no matter how high the value of your home rises or your building, and this is the important, this is the other part I'm going to get to in a minute, no matter how much the value of your property grows in one year or two years or three years, your property tax bill can only go up 2% from what it was in 1975 if you bought your house before then. It can only go up 2% from that point on each year. And so if you think about it, I, I'm the child of someone who my, my grandfather owns a home in Santa Cruz, for instance, and I'll, I'll call myself out. I'll, I'll use my family as the example. So I'm not, you know, just trying to rag on others. My grandfather bought a home in Santa Cruz for $32,000 in 1972. Now, that home is oh, easily, easily worth over a million dollars now. Now, that's a th more than 3,333% increase 
on the value of that home. But if you do the math from 1975 to 2018, that's 44 years, 43 years, which means that his property tax bill probably has doubled in 43 years. So it's gone up about 100%. 2% compounding would probably be about 100% now, maybe 105%. Yet his value of his home has gone up thousands of percent. And many of his neighbors who bought their homes much later only get their property tax held back to whenever they bought it. And many have called Prop 13 California's original sin. And what I mean by that is that in 1977, when these high property taxes started to scare people, or what they viewed as high property taxes, and they were funding the schools through those, in 1978, when this passed, and it limited it to 1%, immediately schools began being cut. And you always hear, I've heard all my life, schools are terrible in California, schools are crumbling, the teachers aren't getting paid enough, um, they don't have maintenance for the facilities, we don't have enough equipment, we have to cancel art, we have to cancel sports, we have to cancel music. This started happening immediately in 1979 in the wake of the passage of Prop 13. And there was one other part of Prop 13 that's very crucial that I want to get to before I get Susan Shelley from the Howard Jarvis Tax Association on the line, is that they also added in to prevent this measure from being reversed by the legislature too easily, they are the ones that put in place through this proposition the requirement that any taxes in California must be passed by the legislature at a two-thirds vote. 66.67% of the legislature must vote in favor of any new taxes at the state level. And as anyone who's lived in California knows, that has pretty much relegated any tax increases fundraising, most measures really go through the ballot initiative process where people mob you outside uh, grocery stores and get you to sign petitions, and then that goes on the ballot if it gets enough signatures, and from there, people vote on the measure to see if we want to raise money for something else, and we can do that outside of the two-thirds vote but it requires all of that footwork and grassroots activism. The ironic thing is, if you look at the 1978 vote of Prop 13, it did not pass by two-thirds. So by its own merits, it didn't pass. The tax reduction and restriction plan that they passed did not pass on the merits of what they say any tax laws should be passed on. Now, of course, they meant tax increases, but the matter still stands that if they were held to the same requirement, we wouldn't have Prop 13 right now. And I'm not arguing against seniors staying in their homes. It's very understandable that people should be able to stay in their homes if they bought their home. I don't think that property tax should account for you essentially rebuying your home over and over again. Which, of course, if they got out of control and really, really high, that could happen. However, Prop 13 also included every piece of real estate in the state. I'm talking shopping malls, music venues, retail shops, apartment complexes, homes that are both as primary residences and homes that are an unlimited number of units that are being rented out for profit by a landlord who doesn't live there. And it's very interesting that this is the most, as 
as has been said by many uh, writers on this, as I've been reading, this is the most protected, the most fiercely protected piece of California law, pretty much, that I can think of. They will cut anything if they really need to from the budget. They will raise other taxes. They will put on sales taxes. We have the highest income tax. According to some, we have the highest income tax in the country, although when you get into deductions, that gets complicated. So I don't want to really give that too much weight. But we have many other taxes, but this property tax one stays in place and refuses to budge no matter how much people say our schools are terrible. And I do have a call coming in, so I'm going to pause that thought real quick. But just thinking, should this apply to all pieces of real estate? And I'm going to get to this call here. Hello, KZSE. This is Dan Wu. KZSE, Dan Wu. Hi, this is Susan Shelley. How's my timing? Hello. How are you? I'm fine. It's pretty good. I was about to get into uh, a little other piece of the situation, but we will uh, we'll get right to you. And first off... Uh, well, I can wait Su- if you want me to. No, no, no. That's totally great. Um, Susan Shelley, Vice President of Communications from the Howard Jarvis Tax Association, is on the line. And uh, can you give the viewers... Uh, the viewers? No, I don't have a camera yet. I haven't gotten that set up. Uh, the listeners, a little view of what you do and what the Howard... Jarvis Tax Association exists for at this point, or a little background on it. Sure, from your point I'm happy of view. to do that. The Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association was founded in 1978 uh, after Proposition 13 was passed overwhelmingly by the voters. And Proposition 13, as you probably already know, is um, a, a, an amendment to the California Constitution that stops the increase of property taxes the way it used to be done. It used to be done according to market value. You would have an assessed value that was the same as your market value, and then the tax rate was a statewide average of 2.67% of the market value. And today, whatever you pay for a property, it can only your assessed value can only go up 2% a year. And then the tax rate was cut to 1% statewide. So a lot of people who would have lost their houses didn't lose their houses, and they were able to stay in California, even on a fixed income, and live where their families were and not be forced out of the state by higher taxes. And Proposition 13 also made it harder to raise other taxes, because Howard Jarvis knew that as soon as we limited property taxes, politicians would want to raise everything else. So it takes a two-thirds vote in the legislature to raise taxes, or a two-thirds vote locally for special taxes, uh, and it has to go to the voters which is really important because otherwise whatever a politician wants in Sacramento, boom, you, they, you just have to pay it and people would be forced out of the state by higher taxes. So what the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association does today is we monitor these different proposals for tax increases. We fight to protect Proposition 13. We fight to protect taxpayers and to make sure that when voters do approve a tax that the money is really spent for what it was intended on and what they were told. We try to hold politicians accountable. So when you say that, and I'm not saying that politicians should be held accountable for decisions they make, absolutely. But according to records I've looked at, the Prop 13 bill passed by 64% to 62% to 34%. Now, yes, that is... I would say, a large victory in an election. But does it strike you at all that it did not meet the two-thirds threshold that you would want to see tax increases passed? And given the fact that it had such a large, like you said, 2.67% down to one within one year, first off, and then limiting those increases over the years... Do you think it's a little disingenuous to have the two-thirds rule for the state legislature when this bill didn't even pass by two-thirds? No, I don't think so, because this was an amendment to the California Constitution, and it passed by the margin that it needed, plus quite a bit. And then the 
the the fact that taxes need a two-thirds vote after that reflects that you don't want a situation where some people can vote to tax other people too easily. And that's that's consistent with many things that go on in the in the US Constitution. There are certain things that you need a supermajority for, like a constitutional amendment, you know, nationwide you would need uh, three quarters of the states, two thirds in each house and three quarters of the states. There are certain things that are really important and you want to make sure you have a good solid consensus for it and you don't just slip it in on one vote. Well that's Barely. what I but that's what I mean is that it was an amendment to the California Constitution and you're saying exactly, you need 38 out of 50 states to ratify an amendment to the Constitution. So why would an amendment passed on the California Constitution not be held to that same standard that you just said is important for a constitutional amendment? Well, in California, you can amend the Constitution, the state Constitution, more easily. So it was consistent with the rules for amending the state Constitution. But what I'm what I'm getting at is that you're saying that changing the constitution is a big decision, and it's it's not it, no, it's no, a what it's I a way that well it's a the, well the it's a raising wait, taxes hold on hold on you, you you shouldn't you shouldn't have a narrow margin for raising taxes if you're looking at something that's going to be for instance just on property owners, or you you want to make sure that you have a good solid consensus that this is necessary and that people can afford it and that they agree with it. So that's what the voters decided. They decided that it should be a two-thirds majority for raising taxes. And you can say that it should take a two-thirds majority to amend the state constitution, but it doesn't. Uh, you, could, you could propose that, but it wasn't the case in 1978, and it's not the case now. No, I understand, but by your own admission, changing a constitution is a more impactful event than passing a law because it's much harder to reverse something like that. And you said that changing the Constitution at the United States level is a very impactful thing, so it takes three quarters of the states to ratify it even after it's voted on. Right. I'm asking, why would you not hold the same standard to something for the California Constitution? Well, you can make that argument. I'm not going to, but you can make that argument. <laughs> okay. And, and, what, and so some of the benefits of Prop 13 that were touted at the time and are still touted are, of course, people being able to stay in their homes. And I do understand that, yeah, if I had to pay an, on any of my possessions, if I had to pay taxes to keep them to the point where it felt like I was repurchasing them, mm -hmm. that would seem a bit unreasonable. Like if, if every 10 years I was paying for that possession again. Right. I do understand that. That makes sense. However, like I said early in the show, I'm not sure how much of it you were hearing, um, but my grandfather's home has increased in value a good 3,000 to 4,000%, although it has not been assessed because it has not been sold. So his tax bill has probably increased about 110% since the mid-70s mm -hmm. at 2% compounding. So many of his neighbors are paying much higher taxes that bought in maybe 10 years ago or 15 or even 25 years ago are still paying a, a good deal higher amount of property taxes than he is. And I understand the whole argument about keeping people in their homes, but there were no exceptions for different pieces of real estate in this bill, that in this uh, proposition. This applied to commercial, sta uh, co commercial spaces, this uh, applied to real estate developers owning many, many homes that get rented out so they're not their primary residence? And does the Howard Jarvis Association feel that it is a handout to businesses to allow this justification of keeping people in their homes to be used for shopping malls and music venues and warehouses? Well, it wasn't just a justification of keeping people in their homes. The principle is the same. If you buy property, should you be taxed out of it based on something that's completely out of your control, which is the market value of the land? The market value of the land is not necessarily cash in your hand, even in a business. And if we were to change Proposition 13 to, to bring all the commercial properties up to market value, which is something that has been proposed, how does that help us to raise taxes on every business in California simultaneously every year? How does that help us? 
businesses are already hurting in California. And if they, if they, if you were to take all these restaurants and all these factories and all these farms, and you were to raise their property taxes simultaneously, what would happen to the economy of California? What would happen to jobs in this state? Well, I question your, I question your assertion that businesses are hurting in California, especially considering that business has been slowly growing for the past nine years and is booming in recent years. But I also want to, to our listeners, I want to let them know that I do have someone on the line right now. I'm working with our radio technicians up here to get two lines possible for future shows like this. But you can text in questions or thoughts on this interview at 831-459-4036. I'm speaking with the Vice President of Communications of the Howard Jarvis Tax Association, Susan Shelley. That's 831 459 Four zero three six, and uh, I would, I would argue the opposite. I would argue that businesses are doing amazingly in California, and that's why so much money is pouring in here. And that's part of the reason, other than the weather and the coastline and the mountains, even some inland places. I love them, but money is pouring in here at rates that have rarely been seen in the history of the world as far as the economic, sustained economic boom in California. Well, so I'm not, not sure about businesses hurting true. here. That's not completely true. You can look around at small businesses and they're not, they're not thriving. And you can look at the poverty rate in California and you can see that the wages are not going up the way they are in other states. And we have the highest poverty rate in the United States. It's not a pretty picture. It's over 20%. And there are many reasons for this, but certainly one of them is that businesses can't hire and can't raise wages in this state the way they can in other states because their expenses are so high. So would you, and, and there's, an, there's an answer to that, or there's a question that I have on that matter too, is would you consider, well, you, obviously the Howard, I, I, I presume that the Howard Jarvis Association would not ad, t entertain this, but... There are also proposals to carve out the exception of, you know, primary residences and maybe someone that owns two rental homes and that's their income and someone who has 25 employees, carve them out separate and keep the Proposition 13 benefits for them. But then companies that have mountains of money, like the Googles, like the Apples, like the Bo like the... Um, uh, Lockheed Martin, like all the weapons manufacturers that have their headquarters in Orange County, like the banks, and and not have large businesses benefit from these same Proposition 13 benefits that I haven't even gotten to, but they also keep them sometimes even after the properties are sold. Would well, you carve out? Would you carve out an exception? to keep small businesses keeping the Prop 13 benefits if some of the larger companies that literally have half a trillion dollars between Google and Apple sitting in reserves, not even being used for property or employing or wages or anything? Well, California has always had a, a, what's called a unitary property tax role, which is everything is taxed as the same. And if you do well with it, congratulations. That's, that's, always, been, that's always been the law is that the property taxes are not decided based on how well you're doing or whether you need help or you don't need help. The idea is that it's the same deal for everybody. And even though properties next door to each other have different property tax assessments because of when they were purchased, two properties that are bought at the same time and are of the same value have the same property tax assessment. It's a question of time and and it's, a, it's sort of a rough ability to pay for homeowners, but that's, it's not intended to be that way. It's just uh, the, the purchase price is the assessed value, and then it can only go up 2% a year. And that's the same for everybody in California, no matter what kind of property it is. If you want to go down the path of looking at each individual business and saying, well, you need help and you don't need help, and here's a homeowner who has too much, and here's a homeowner who doesn't have enough, now you're not in a free country. Now you've put the government in charge of deciding 
who needs what they have and who doesn't need what they have. I, I disagree with that fundamentally because of the fact that all of what you just said is there are different deals for different people. And I'm not going through the list of saying who's doing well and who's doing who's not doing well. But it's the same with benefits that need to be paid when an employer has more than 50 employees. We have a different minimum wage in California for employers that have less than 25 employees. It's 50 cents an hour less if you have less than 25 employees. And if you have more than 25 employees, it's 50, 50 cents more. So you now, think property taxes should be, should be done the same way? I'm asking, well, I'm asking, is it really what Howard Jarvis sold the state of California on when he said that it was about the woman in the interview that I've seen in the documentary? Well, what you should know uh, no, well, is no, that wait, 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 no. time... I, I want to I finish this. Is that is that really the same thing that they were sold when they said this is about having this woman who looked very sweet and her property tax had doubled in one year and that got blasted out on the airwaves? Was that what they were sold when then Disney and Apple and Lockheed Martin get the same property tax bill and realtors that own hundreds of homes get the same property tax bill while they're raising rents like crazy? Well, at the time that Proposition 13 was on the ballot, there was another measure that was also put before the voters. I believe it was Proposition 8, and that was a split role. That had a different rate for and a different deal for commercial property, income property and business property and industrial property, and the voters rejected it. There was a full debate on this very issue, and the voters chose Proposition 13 which was good for businesses, it was good for homeowners, it was good for the economy of California. And it's, it is just not true. It is, it is urban mythology that the voters were sold this on the basis of keep grandma in the house. That is just not true. Now, even if it does include businesses, let's say it does include all businesses, let's leave it the way it is for the basis of this, is... The idea that many of the benefits that Prop 13, one second actually, there's a listener uh, that wrote in, both taxes that could be earned if commercial properties were excluded from Prop 13 tax advantage could be used to help the poor. If she cares about the poor as an affordable housing credit building, oh, that affordable housing credits could improve public and public transportation improvements. I'm sorry, this gets broken up. And public transportation improvements could help with commute times for low-income workers if some of those property taxes were amended. And, and that kind of goes along with what I was going to get to is do Howard Jarvis Tax Association followers or employees have children in public school? Well, sure. And there are lots and lots of taxes that people pay and have paid for public schools. You know, California has the highest taxes in the country. We have a top income tax rate of 13.3. I think the next highest is 10-something. I think it's Maine. We have the highest state sales tax, 7 and a quarter, in the whole country. There isn't one single state that's higher than we are. And there are all the rest are lower on income tax. All the rest are lower on sales tax. Everybody's lower on gas tax, except I think Pennsylvania might be an eyelash ahead of us, but it won't, not for long because ours is going to go up again. We have the highest taxes in the country. Well, also, that's a little disingenuous because a lot of those taxes began going up after Prop 13 passed when in 1979 there was a 30% across the board cut in state funding to education in direct response to Prop 13. There was also, at the same time, a series of court decisions that re reorganized funding for education and took it away from the local level and ran it through the state. So some of what you're describing is that. And, and you should look really closely at that. Oh, I, I've been looking really closely at all of that. But the, the fact of the matter is that 30% of state funding was cut in 1979 as a direct result of Prop 13. It has nothing to do with any of those. There were other court decisions that have moved where funding for schools goes, and the same thing happened with redevelopment agencies about 10 years ago. But the 30% statewide cut was Jerry Brown and the legislature 
who opposed Prop 13 having to go along with the will of the people and figure out a way to make it work. And since then, my entire life, I'm 33 years old, I've been told that the master plan for education in 1960 set up one of the best schooling systems in the world. And yeah, it was expensive. I'm not going to fault you that. Like, yeah, it's expensive to have a great school system. But everyone talks about it crumbling and how LA city schools suck and how, how all these schools in California are terrible now and there's no funding and you got to cut music and you got to cut sports and you got to cut painting classes and you got to cut after school activities and then they complain that kids are getting in trouble. Well, you're and putting a whole all, lot of stuff I am, on I am the putting, tax base here I that am is putting, actually caused by a number of other things. Absolutely, First of all, we are but, spending but a when lot you, wait, of money hold on, hold on. on education in California. It's yeah. not true that spending is lower than it used to be. It we're is. spending more. In dollar and amounts. And where is it going? In dollar amounts, but not per student and not in comparison to other okay, states in the country. Okay, but we're spending it in dollars. You're collecting it from people in dollars, and then you're spending it. Where is it going? Is it going to administrators? Is it going to health benefits that are more generous than the private sector? Is it going to buildings instead of in, inside classrooms to teachers? Where is the money going? Where is it going? Is it spent on pensions? Are the pensions responsible or are they unaffordable? Is the staffing level appropriate, particularly yeah. for administrators? You have to look at all of that. We are spending an enormous amount of money on education in California. We spend we spend less than forty other states per student well, in California, now you're, and that now you're includes with statistics. and that. Uh, well, I mean, that's what we're talking about: is numbers, dollars, and statistics. And we spend we're the forty first ranked on every list that I've found. We are the forty first ranked per student spender on schools and that includes all those costs and yeah i'll give you that i don't like the fact that superintendents get paid a half a million dollars and they never have to talk to a student i don't agree with that i think those are problems that need to be solved as well but the fact is when you drain the schools of funding from the from prop 13 in 1979 this is just simply not true it, it's it absolutely simply true simply not true and if you think that you could raise the property tax. You, let's let's say you eliminate Prop 13 and everyone has to pay 2.67% of the market value of their home. You think that's going to fix it? No, but but see, that's what that's what this argument becomes is you either are you either hate schools or you hate seniors is the way that this is made. And I understand that. And that's a false choice. It is. And you just gave me that choice. You said that we get rid of Prop 13 and everyone has to pay 2.67% of the market value of their home. That's a false choice. What I am proposing is that larger businesses pay a property tax that is more in line with the value of their property because they raise their prices every year due to inflation. Every time that a tax increase comes through, they just pass that on to the consumer. And if this is really about keeping people in their homes, I would ask because it does, it, one of the things that Prop 13 was sold on was that it would be a stability of the tax base. And it is true that after 1979, it was more stable in the amount that was brought in from property taxes as opposed to the past when, yes, if someone was having to repurchase their home, they might be pushed out of it, and therefore it has a high turnover in the community. But the same arguments being made for Prop 13 are the same arguments being made for rent control, and what people say about rent control is that it's bad for the economy in so and so and so ways, yet the same arguments about keeping the stability of the community and having... Uh, an ability to plan for next year's costs without well, unknown increases. Complete, hold on. The those same, no, the same arguments things. get made for rent control that are for Prop 13, but for some reason you're saying they hold weight for Prop 13. Well, this is a logical fallacy, first of all. You said yourself that you can see the point of not being taxed so that you're purchasing something over and over again. If somebody buys property, that's their property. They own that. That's theirs. Rent control is asking for a subsidy from somebody else's property. That's a whole different thing. You're asking people who own a business, rental property is a business, 
to subsidize the people who live in their units, to subsidize their customers. Everyone and subsidizes everyone. That's what taxes are. We subsidize things that everyone needs well, so, that, so that you everyone pays into them. between taxation and rent control? Well, I do see differences, but what I'm saying is, well, also, I want to let the listeners in here a little bit. Uh, one person wrote, the people that lived here since we raised our children and they grew up here, the dot, bom the dot com bomb killed the way we live, so many friends left because people wanted to take our way of life. Well, no time to worry about what side of town you live on or whether you can even recognize them. And it's true that... The, I live in Santa Cruz. I live in... Well, no, no, no. You lost me a dot-com bomb. I know. Bomb. I know. And I need to tell our I'm listeners... Sorry. No, no, no. I it's okay. That. It's okay. Hold on. I need to tell our listeners, if you're going to text in, use complete sentences. I understand. <laughs> no. Well, yeah. Hold on. Um, I understand texting is a different thing, but I have to read them on the air. So if you can write it out like it's an actual note, it really, really helps get your, uh, get your point across. There is one that looks like I can go with it. Uh, both taxes that could be earned if commercial properties were excluded from Prop 13 tax advantage could be used to help the poor. That's okay. So they rewrote that one for me. Thank you very much. Uh, you guys got to use complete sentences. I'm very sorry about that. Um, it's just I'm on the spot reading them uh, to our interview subject as well. Now, it is very true that having a stable community is good and all of those things. And being able to plan for next year's costs is great. That's why we don't have out-of-control inflation like they do in, like, super corrupt countries where they just start a new currency. And, yeah, we're far from that. But it is a mild version of the same thing to say that it is nice to be able to plan for next year's costs. And that's what you're saying with Prop 13, and I agree with you on that. I'm Absolutely. Saying, I'm saying there's a difference between owning property. There's just a legal difference between owning property and renting property. If you're renting, you are a customer of someone else's business. And if you own property, it's, it's part of the role of government in a free country to protect property rights because if the government can take what you own, you are not free. You work for them. It's a fundamental freedom issue. But wouldn't you say that that dynamic creates a... I'll tell you what's uh, wrong in California. No, 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 no. no I'm going to ask you a question. I'll, I'll ask you a question because it's my show, or I'll just wait. Hold on. No, I, I'm going to ask you a question. Is that setting up a dynamic like that sets up a feudal society where the government is basically an arm of landlords and real estate owners, and therefore you're saying that renters have no rights? I'm saying that renters are customers of somebody else's business, and this is what's wrong in California. Because we're not building enough housing, it has become impossible at the wages that businesses are paying, because they're not doing well, at the wages that businesses are paying, you cannot buy the median house in California. It has become completely unaffordable. We have the politics of shortages in this state, and there is no good reason for it. This is self-inflicted damage Where are you through build? policies and regulations that have curtailed the building of housing. And so people like yourself who are in their 30s who should be easily able to buy a house somewhere in California. I'm a community radio host. I'll never be able to buy a house. Well, you should be able to buy a house. You should Maybe you can't buy a house on the west side of Los Angeles, but you should be able to buy a house or a condo. You should not be looking at rent as your only option. There are and so many houses. there is not enough construction. And this has been going on for a decade. And I'll give you the exact bill that was the problem. It was SB 375, the Sustainable Communities Act, which sounds lovely, but what it means is we're not going to have sprawl anymore. We're not going to build in outlying areas because people have to drive to work and it's just not good for the climate. But we do that all the time. That's not being enforced. This is 10 years of deliberately grinding no. down what do you the call the entire housing starts. no 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 what do you call the entire central valley and the entire area 30 miles to the east of san francisco that everyone commutes from and my hometown of santa cruz that people commute from and outlying every, and, every, and hesperia east of la where people commute in from and all of the highways they're building there's no sustainable communities act that's being enforced in any strong way well, they're building raised, sprawling done, houses it's everywhere it's raised the cost of building it's raised the cost it's created sequel legis sequel litigation 
for many of these projects. Many projects have gone forward. We are not building enough housing. It's where do you a propose? Problem. Where do you propose we build two million houses? Because I'm not LA a alone, use attorney. LA, <laughs> no, hold on, hold on, hold that, on. No, that, hold on, hold on. LA says they need a hundred thousand more homes to make up for what they are short right now. And I might even be low on that number. But where do you say that L.A. County builds 100,000 homes without also disrupting the community that people, property owners, bought in to live in? Because that's another thing is that property owners are the ones who want the sustainable acts because they don't want more houses built next to the house that they already bought. Well, you can't do too much density, but there's a lot of land in California. This is a big state, and only like I think 10% of it is is built is built to um, into an urban area. So there's where would lo- you build two million houses? Land. And and it's it's policies that have made housing so expensive. It's policies that have curtailed the development of new areas. It's water policies. It's climate policies. It's a deliberate effort to grind down the population and create shortages. And um, we are feeling the politics of it. We're at each other's throats in this state. Okay, just to remind the listeners, one listener asked, I am speaking with the Vice President of Communications from the Harold Jarvis Tax Association, uh, Harold Jarvis, who wrote Prop 13, which limited property taxes to 1% as of 1975 if the house was bought before then, and then only 2% on that 1% each year after that they let only me just, let me just clarify well, no nope. howard, howard jarvis taxpayers association and the website is hjta.org yeah. okay um so they also in that bill stated that it takes a two-thirds vote for any new taxes to be passed in california which as long as one party that doesn't want more taxes has 37% of the legislature, then essentially no new taxes can be passed. And I want to ask you what you think about parcel taxes. Well, parcel taxes have become a workaround for um, for cities that can't get the votes to raise taxes for, um, through Prop 13. So what, they, what they've tried to do is they are creating new ways to tax property. Uh, I'm not a fan of parcel taxes. There's one that's going to be on the ballot in Los Angeles County for stormwater. What they've decided to do is tax each square foot of impermeable surface. This is a brand new way of doing property taxes. So we'll see if they can get two-thirds of voters to, to agree to that. But it's, parcel taxes are added to the bottom of the property tax bill along with voted indebtedness, all the fees for bonds that the voters approve. And this this gradually adds up and adds up and adds up. Well, what would and you say to businesses that do support property uh, par- parcel taxes because mm-hmm. they know that usually rather than square, that they're based on either square foot or number of units mm-hmm. rather than the value of the unit. So if you have one building that's worth $10 million, you're going to pay the same as someone who owns one home that's worth a half a million dollars, you're yeah. going to pay the same amount. So a lot of businesses are like, ha we're going to pass that cost on to the homeowners that the Howard Jarvis Tax Association said that they want to protect. They literally pushed those parcel taxes costs onto homeowners because of the way that Prop 13 has set up the dynamic with property taxes in this state. And my question is, again, that the stability of a community, the planning for next year's costs, and not having high turnover in your community to create instability are the same arguments that Prop 13 is making with businesses and with residences, yet you're saying that the same can never be applied to renters' rights. Correct? I'm not following you. Renters so we can't, are customers so you can't, of somebody so else's essentially, business. Essentially, Prop 13 is a drastic rent control for landlords. No. It's a Yes, it is. It is a price... It is a price control that states that property taxes cannot go up more than 2% from what they were last year, and they can't be more than 1% of the property value when it was purchased. So that is essentially the same as saying rent can't go up more than 2% per year. There's no other way to look at that. Well, you're wrong. I'm not wrong. You are wrong because rent is a business arrangement, a voluntary business arrangement, and taxation is government force, and those are two completely different things. 
It's a business arrangement with the government. We live in a we, we live in a we live in a democratic society with many socialist aspects, including roads, garbage pickup, sewage lines. That is not socialism. It is that, absolutely socialism. We pay for things. Socialism. It is for it is absolutely socialism. If you look up perfect capitalism and perfect socialism, we are somewhere in the middle because we have private ownership of homes. We have private ownership of cars. We have socialist ownerships of sewage lines, okay. of tell highways. Me, tell me your ideal arrangement for society. Go ahead and tell me. And if it sounds anything like the Soviet Union, you've lost the argument. We pay for roads, we pay for sewage, we pay for garbage pickup, and what we pay mean, for utilities on, together. We? You the mean the government that, pays for everything and the they just take people, money from people in taxation? The people that live here and then almost everything else can be private enterprise. What do you mean almost everything else? Anything that's not providing... So everyone... So the government uh, provides housing? No. I didn't say that, did I? I said roads, sewage, garbage pickup, and utilities that everyone uses, or to the point of like global warming being 99% proven, you know... 99% of people use PG&E or Southern California Edison, right? Most people... I don't know what the percentage is. We don't, it's, we don't, in Los it's, Angeles, we have yeah. a city-owned municipal utility. Exactly, and almost everyone uses it. And my point being is that's socialism that I like. City-owned municipalities, that's awesome. So utilities, <laughs> that's awesome. That's super awesome. That's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking Angeles about. Under the DWP, that's, that's why you think oh, no, it's we, awesome. <laughs> no, we have one up here, and there's one in Marin, and it's super awesome. I'm speaking with Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association Vice President of Communications Susan Shelley, and uh, someone wrote in all those new homes would be unaffordable too, and would quickly be filled by renters who can't afford to buy, and then rent keeps going up. Renters deserve rights. What would you say to someone who? feels that you build more houses, it, there's so much, there's so many people wanting to live here. If you build more houses, they're just going to sell at a mil. I, my friend just sold her house in three days for an absurd amount of money. There's no, there, there's no economic downturn here that you're talking about that's really pushing people to need tax breaks in their commercial property like a stadium. Well, that's a whole separate thing. No, you, it's not. you might be completely right about that. I did, you know, some of these that's stadiums, what I'm saying. Some of so, these stadium okay. deals are there you crony go. capitalism. I'm not a fan of crony capitalism. Which is also socialism, and that's I will get I, I will give you that that communism and crony capitalism end up being the same things because even if people say the state runs it, it's still a few people that are the state. And I, I'll give you that. Crony capitalism and communism I mean, are the same thing, and that's what basically happens when you have someone buying a skyscraper, making an LLC and therefore not having it reassessed when it's sold to them so they get the same tax break that the previous owner had. And there's all these loopholes in Prop 13, and one person I read an article today, this morning, it said, there are no loopholes in Prop 13, there's just vague language that allows for people to work around it. That's literally the definition of a loophole. Well, hang and on that's, a second. The, you just the, said, you just said that these large businesses like stadiums... Commercial property is not actually in Prop 13. That's in a law that defines what a sale is. And that is something that we have actually supported fixing. And it was the Democrats in Sacramento who, who killed that bill. Okay, well, I look forward loophole. to hearing you push for fixing that. And also, you said just a moment ago that you'd be open to some of these, like a, like someone who owns a stadium-sized business or a large, large building that's for commercial for-profit uses, maybe having not the protections of Prop 13? Did no, you just say I that when I said stadiums? No, I was talking about I was talking about the whole the whole suite of tax breaks and other types of subsidies that are sometimes associated with stadium deals. I wasn't speaking of anything in specifics, not any specific stadium deal, but sometimes there's crony capitalism, not just in California, but in, in many different cities involving the construction of stadiums where it's, um, it's kind of a sweetheart deal with politicians. So, so I'm you not would... in favor of that, but I'm not talking about Prop 13 protections. All property in California is protected by Prop 13, and it should be. Okay. So, but with rent control, even if rent control passes in the many forms that cities have it on the ballot this year and that uh, Richmond had it on the ballot before and it passed, you would not agree with taking away all the carved out exceptions from rent control, such as uh, single family homes and the Costa Hawkins Act or any of those things. I think it's a big mistake 
to repeal the Costa Hawkins Act. I, I really do. And, and let, me, let me put you in a different mindset, okay? Role play with me for just a second. You own an apartment building. That's your business. And tenants move in. And you've got a 30-year mortgage, and you've got the water bill and the electric bill and the maintenance and the whole schedule of expenses, and you have worked out exactly how much it's going to cost you in order for this business to be profitable so that it's worth your time to do it. Because otherwise, you could go invest in, in Coca-Cola stock or something else. You can invest in anything you want. It's a business. You're in this business, and all of a sudden, the city that you're located in passes a rent control ordinance. And now what happens to your business? All your tenants have lucked out. They've won the lottery. Their rent won't go up. What happens, first of all, to your business? What happens to the next wave of tenants who want an apartment? Because the people who are in your building are never going to leave. Never. <laughs> They're never going to leave. You're going to be subsidizing those people forever. And if your water rates go up and your electric rates go up and your gardening costs go up and the paint costs go up and you need a new roof, you just eat that because you can't pass it through to the tenants and you can't raise their rent. Right. Now, how many I, people are going to go into the business of rental housing with that on the horizon? All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Susan Shelley, Vice President of Communications for Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. We got to go. This has been unquestionable with Dan Wu. Thank you so much for the callers texting in. Um, I do, to the one caller, I'm not sure how you got the idea that I don't care about the people that live here, but uh, definitely that is not the case, and um, I'm very sorry to hear that. We do have one announcement. Uh, tune in Monday from 1 to 3 p.m. for Cruise Control. DJ Lizard brings you tracks to tune to turn up and tune everything else out only on 88.1 FM KZSE Santa Cruz. That's coming up in just a minute here, and we got the concert calendar. I'm running a little behind schedule because that interview was really engulfing for me. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening. This is Bugging Unquestionable. I'll be back next week with Zach Friend and Danny Keith. Thank you so much. This is the concert calendar. Uh, Tuesday, July 24th, Polyrhythmics.